All right, we're going to talk about some pulmonary circulatory disorders now. The first one we're going to talk about is pulmonary arterial hypertension. And this is whenever you have continuous high pressure in your pulmonary artery. <laughs> I know, it's shocking, right, based on the title? Anyway, it's increasing your pulmonary arterial pressure or your PA pressure. It results from heart disease or lung disease or both. It's not usually clinically apparent, which means you're not going to be able to see signs and symptoms until the patient is very ill. Um, a lot of times, they're going to have a resistance in their pulmonary blood flow that increases the pressure, um, which then in eventually increases the workload in the right ventricle of the heart. Um, normal pul uh, pulmonary arterial pressure is 25 over 10 millimeters of mercury. Pulmonary hypertension is whenever you have 40 over 15 millimeters of mercury. I'm not expecting you to remember those numbers, but it's just interesting to see the difference between normal and hypertension. Now, it's very different with blood pressures because you have kind of bigger jumps between the numbers, right? With this, it's not a very big jump. It's only 15. So um, 15 in the systolic and 5 in the diastolic. So it's very important to notice the slight differences with pulmonary arterial pressures. Eventually, you're going to notice um, enlargement in the heart and possibly hypertension um, in the blood pressure as well. The prim primary pulmonary hypertension is rare, um, and it usually occurs more often in women who are 20 to 40 years old, um, and it's usually fatal within five years of diagnosis. Secondary pulmonary hypertension usually comes alongside some other kind of issue. Usually, it occurs with some kind of um, COPD disorder. Um, in secondary pulmonary hypertension, the alveoli are going to be destroyed and eventually will cause increased resistance and pressure in the um, vasculature that supplies oxygenation to the lungs, um, which eventually will lead then to pulmonary hypertension. The signs and symptoms you're going to see are dyspnea with exertion, um, a lot of weakness, um, some secondary causes you're going to or secondary signs and symptoms you're going to see an underlying cardiac or respiratory um, respiratory issues also like chest pain, fatigue, jugular vein distension, um, maybe some ortho orthopnea where they have trouble lying down um, and breathing, um, and maybe also some peripheral edema. To diagnose it, we want to look at an EKG that's going to show um, right ventricular hypertrophy or failure. An ABG is going to show abnormal values. A heart cath is going to show elevated pressures within the heart. And pulmonary function tests are going to show an increased residual volume but decreased forced expiratory volume, meaning they breathe in and then they barely can let go of that air at all. A VQ scan, and if you remember what VQ means, it's um, uh, ventilation and perfusion scan, um, and that's going to show defective vessels. A pulmonary angiogram is going to show where um, wherever the infected, uh, defective vessels are, um, and if they do that by injecting dye into those vessels and the blood flow blockages are going to be able to be seen at that point. To treat it, we can give them some vasodilators um, just to open up those vessels and allow for um, more adequate blood flow and decrease the pressures. Um, and also some anticoagulants are going to be really effective to decrease the incidence of clots because of the hypertension. We also want to manage the underlying condition, whatever it may be. We're going to give them some oxygen um, just to increase the oxygenation of their blood. And then as a nurse, we want to recognize the symptoms of respiratory distress and be able to treat those effectively. We want to conserve their energy as much as possible by increasing their rest and relaxation and um, also uh, increasing their oxygen consumption. All right, now we're looking at PEs or pulmonary embolism. Now this is something that can develop from any clot anywhere in the body that dislodges and becomes an embolus and eventually lodges itself in the blood flow um, to the heart, the pulmonary, or not to the heart, to the lungs, <laughs> um, the pulmonary arteries or its branches. It can, like we said, it can be caused by any thrombus that eventually breaks off. Um, it can occur after surgery where the, um, the patient develops a clot maybe in their legs or their arms or something. It dislodges because of embolus. Um, eventually, you're going to start noticing dyspnea and some hemoptysis. Um, let's see. It causes infarction or um, a blockage of oxygenated blood flow to a portion of the lung tissue. And eventually, that portion of the lung tissue will die and will be replaced with scar tissue, which then cannot expand and contract the way that lung tissue should be able to. 
three conditions that expose um, a patient to a PE um, involves first shelf triad. Now you'll learn that in cardiac, so you should remember what that is, but um, first shelf triad, just to refresh, is whenever you experience venous stasis, vessel trauma, or hypercoagulation because of altered platelets or clotting factors. The signs and symptoms of a PE you're really going to first just notice some shortness of breath, then some chest pain, and maybe some tachycardia. If a large area of the lung gets involved, they're going to have severe pain, severe tachycardia, and probably some cyanosis too. Um, you're gonna, they're going to experience some restlessness because of the decreased oxygenation and probably um, eventually going to shock as well. The diagnostic test we can do to um, evaluate if somebody has a PE or not is look at their um, elevated serum enzymes. Um, we also are going to see a chest x-ray that's going to show atelectasis as a result of the obstruction to the pulmonary blood flow. An EKG um, is done just to rule out an MI because a lot of times it presents the same way with the chest pain um, and you know trouble breathing and everything as well. Um, we can do a lung scan to visualize um, or a CT scan. We can also do a pulmonary angiogram that's going to show the blockage in the blood flow through the lungs. Um, and then we also want to see if they have signs and symptoms of any presence of a DDT. To treat it, it just depends on the area of involvement. A lot of times we're going to give them IV heparin to prevent any further clotting, and we probably will end up giving them TPA, which is a thrombolytic, that's a clot buster, just to bust up whatever it is that's um, clogging the blood flow through um, the pulmonary arteries. We want to put them on complete bed rest because the worst thing that we could do is dislodge any further clots and cause even worse um, damage to the lung tissue. We want to give them some supplemental oxygen just to restore the oxygenation status to their tissues and um, their perfusion. We probably will end up doing an embolectomy as well. Well, we won't. The doctor will. The surgeon. Um, especially if it's lodged in a main pulmonary artery. And that's just to remove that blockage and hopefully restore blood flow. Um, they can also place a green filled filter. It's like an umbrella filter just to prevent recurrence. And it's the same kind of thing that we did with um, the um, umbrella filters that we used in cardiac. Same kind of thing. As a nurse, we want to do our best to prevent DVTs by getting patients up, walking them around after surgery. We want to check their um, coagulation test just to see um, how likely it is that they will develop a clot. Um, and then once we do know of a DVT, we want to manage that patient um, and elect, you know, don't let them move around, don't allow for that clot to be um, dislodged until it's resolved. Um, you want to encourage patients to wear their TED hose and their SCD boots, and that is our, that's our responsibility. If the patient gets up and goes to the bathroom and gets back in bed and we don't put their SCD boots back on them, that's our fault if they develop a clot. Okay, so it's very important as a nurse to make sure those are on. Um, we also want to perform some active and passive leg exercises, especially if they're on bed rest. Um, you know, pick up their legs, move them around. Now, don't do that if they have a clot, but that's what we do to prevent clots, right? All right, um, we're going to take a break, and I'll come back in a second.